so bored. I wish I had something to do. <sighs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look. An empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed, you're just gonna sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull on our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, fight! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. shower. Does somebody want to come use the bathroom while I'm in here? We give it up for all the moms in the room. Happy Mother's Day. We are excited to be with you today. I'm Monty and this is Rachel and if this is your first time at Meadows Church, we want to say welcome home. Like, we are so excited that you're here. I'm, I'm not kidding when I tell you that every weekend we have new people come and show up, and uh, that's a blessing, and we're, we're so blessed to have you. We want to get to know you. There's um, connect cards on the chair backs, these green cards that are in the little pouches. Thank you, Rachel. Um, they, they're for you. They're for everybody, but if you're a first-time guest, Fill that out, turn it into guest services. We have a gift just for being with, or just for you being with us today. We'd love to give that to you. Also, moms, gosh, if you haven't, if you haven't signed up for a massage, we're giving four of them away at this service. So you can run out right now. I'm not gonna judge you. If you wanna go sign up and you haven't yet, but we're gonna draw those during the service and they'll be, the winners will be out at guest services. Also, I should mention, Rachel, that we have a, uh, uh, photo booth, a mom's photo booth, right, right in the coffee area. So get your picture. Um, we'd love to celebrate moms with you and with cupcakes and sugar and donuts and anything else that gives us diabetes, right? So anyway, so I, uh, God's given us a mission at Meadows, leading people to Christ and their God-given purpose. Uh, two more people gave their lives to Christ last weekend at Meadows Church. Unbelievable. It is amazing what God is doing. It is amazing. And if you've been part of Meadows for more than a couple weeks, you already know this, but I'm going to remind you again. Uh, our kids' ministry, which is birth through fifth grade, happens right during the service. It is our number one ministry, and right with it is our youth ministry, sixth through twelfth grade, that happens every Wednesday. Rachel, you get to lead that, don't you? You're one of the leaders. One of the leaders, yes. You're one of the amazing leaders that we have on Wednesday. In fact, Rachel, you have something exciting to say about what's happening in youth right now? Yeah, so as summer is coming up, we're um, really encouraging all of our kids to go to summer youth camp. We're really excited about this. Um, I've personally been to this camp and it was life changing and I'm excited that I get to go with all the kids again this year. Um, if you're interested in camp, it's July 25th through the 29th and it's going to happen at Dort College in Iowa. Um, we're going to have middle schoolers and high schoolers out there at the same time. And today is the last day to sign up for the cheapest fee. So if you're interested in all, uh, if you're interested at all in that, there's a youth table out in the Welcome Center. We have packets out there for you to look at. Um, there will be youth leaders out there to talk to you if you have any questions. But we're really excited about this. So if you have a kid that's going into sixth grade in the fall, up to seniors that are graduating this year, I believe, are all welcome to come to youth camp. So let us know if you're interested, and we'll get you hooked up. 
We're excited for it. We're also excited because in two weeks, say two, two, two weeks, we're baptizing a bunch of people at Meadows Church. And it's going to be, it'll happen right during the service. Both services, um, it's going to be amazing. And let me just tell you who it's for. Anybody that you've, you've, you've committed your life to Jesus, or, or sometimes we get off track and we, we, we go our own way again and then we have to recommit. If, you, if you've been in those shoes where you've committed or recommitted and you haven't been baptized to declare that, this is your next step. Baptism, it does not save you. A relationship with Jesus saves you. You'll hear more about that today. But baptism, it, it declares, I'm made new. I'm part of the family of God. I love the Lord. I want to live for Him. So I'm telling you, even if you have questions, uh, write baptism on your connect card. Turn it into guest services. We'll connect with you, but we would love to get you baptized if you haven't been there yet or done that yet on May 22nd in two weeks. We are super, super excited. And I'll tell you, everything that we talk about, everything that we do, uh, we did an outreach yesterday for veterans. I mean, all these things that we do as a church are to pour into people. I mean, that's why God sent Jesus, right? People. People at the end of the day matter. It's one of our core values. And, and to do what we get to do, we get to do it because of you and the way that you give back to God. Right, Rachel? Yeah. Yeah, we're so thankful for everyone that gives to our mission here at Meadows. You're making a true impact for the kingdom. You're making an impact in the communities, and we're so grateful for you all. If you're at all interested um, in giving, there are ways you can do it um, on the screen behind me. But let's check out a testimony from someone about giving. So I've been tired of my whole life. And it wasn't until I grew up a bit and started earning my own paychecks to where I actually started to feel tithing, you know, and really start thinking about what tithing was, why I did it. And also really recognizing the faithfulness of God through consistently giving back to Him. We know that tithing is not giving to God what is mine, but giving back to God what is already His. And I could go on and on and on about moments where God has demonstrated his faithfulness just because I tithe. Now my wife and I, we tithe. We give, we give back to God consistently. There was even one circumstance. Uh, we were living in our uh, first apartment, our first home, uh, and we were struggling one month in particular with paying rent. Finances were tight, and I remember going into our kitchen where my wife was, and I wrapped my arms around her, and I just started to pray. I said, God, we specifically trust you to take care of uh, our rent this month. And I kid you not, the next morning I got a text message uh, from a very close friend of mine saying, hey, don't want to overwhelm you, but I felt like the Lord just prompted me. My wife and I want to give you and Cassie, that's my wife's name, we want to give you and Cassie a thousand dollars. That was pretty much to a T what our rent was. Praise God, he's so faithful. So if you're on the edge, do it. And don't just do it once, keep going. God is faithful. You might not always feel it in a moment, but just remember that tithing is not about feeling good. Tithing is about obedience. Keep honoring him with your finances and he's going to blow you away, I promise you. It's an amazing story. Um, Bryce, I still expect you to pay me back though for that thousand, but anyway, I'm just kidding. So I mean, it's, there's stories that come out of us giving, which are pretty amazing. And it's just a step of faith. And so many people do it every week. New people do it every week. And we always say that you can't outgive God and you can't. He's the greatest gift giver there is. And uh, I'm gonna, I've asked Rachel to pray for us for God's blessing and his, um, his hand all over this service. So Rachel, would you pray for us? Heavenly Father, I just, I always begin my prayers with thanking you for bringing us here today, and it's because I can't imagine a life where I don't get to be with these people every week. So I just thank you for every person that walked through the doors today that's, that's deciding to participate in, in worship with you, deciding to participate in a community of believers and, and actively being a part of a family. I pray that today you would just bless us all um, through the message that you've given Pastor Monty. I thank you for all the moms in the room. Gosh, when I think of moms, I just think of how sacrificial they are. They're selfless and almost, almost too selfless sometimes. So I pray that this week they would find time to just take care of themselves and just find rest in you, Father. We all need rest. And I pray that this week you would all give us, give us the rest that we need so that we can go throughout our weeks just um, actively loving others and becoming more like you daily. 
I pray for the message that you've given Pastor Monty, that it would just speak into each of us, that we would each take something with us as we leave the service. Um, I pray that it would even uh, preach to Pastor Monty. I pray that all of us would just feel so overwhelmed um, by your love and, and hope that we have in you, Father. We love you so, so much. And now we're gonna pray the Lord's Prayer together. It'll be on the screen behind me if you need the words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And amen. I, uh, I'm excited about a new series that we begin today. And to set it up, I think we've all been in a situation where we're not having a good day, and someone will try to encourage you or cheer you up, and they'll say something like, you know what? It's a bad day, but, you know, tomorrow's a new day. It'll be better. Or there are better days ahead, or there's a brighter future for you. But the reality is that may not be true. Right? You might be having a bad day, but tomorrow could be worse. You might be thinking, oh, I lost my job today. Well, tomorrow you could get hit by a truck. That would be worse, right? It doesn't, like we say at the church all the time, the best is yet to come. But the reality is, that's a conditional statement. I hope the best is yet to come for you and me. But for, for many, it, it, there's, there's worse days ahead. So I started thinking about this, this saying that we, we say all the time at Meadows Church. And I started thinking, okay, God, what do you have to say about our best life, our best days. And, and here's what I believe God wants us to know, is the best is yet to come if, say if, if, if we do some things, if we live a certain way, if we, if we listen a certain way, and, and I, like, right out the gate, God hit us with a, a pretty, um, what could be an emotional message, because we're going to start this series with a title of a message called the best is yet to come, and help me out, repeat after me, say, if we confess our mess. If we confess our mess, I'm telling you straight up, one of the number one things that will hold you back from your best life is unconfessed sin. Now, um, I, I think there's different avenues and different levels of this, like confessing to God for forgiveness. I don't think that's as hard for many people, because, you know, we can't see him and he, he's not going to, you know, we, we don't feel his hand right away on us if we, if we need to be disciplined. But confessing to somebody else, that's a whole different ballgame. Now, I was fortunate enough to get introduced to this at a young age, going to St. Mary's Catholic grade school. Um, third grade is when we started confession. I mean, can you imagine? So I, I'll never forget it. Lining up the third grade kids in uniform in our uniforms, right, wearing our, uh, what do we wear, blue pants, white shirt, red sweater, and all of us would march across the playground from the school to the church. And we would get to the church, and we'd go into a little confessional, just like you would see on maybe a TV or a movie show, uh, where, where we're in there, and there's this screen, and you see the silhouette of the person on the other side, it was the priest, and we have to start confessing our sins. And it was, I mean, for a third grader, it was like, Oh my God, I remember being in there and I, I you know, what, what sins do you commit in third grade? I don't know, I think probably, um, I think I was confessing that maybe I lied about my homework, I pushed Susie down in the playground, I have four sisters, so I probably punched one of them in the throat throughout the week, I don't know, I, we, there were some bad things, but we, I, we, we, we would be confessing and as I went through grade school, it was a small school. And the priest knew a lot of us. He taught religion class to us. So I started to get self-conscious because I think the priest knew me. He knew my voice. So I literally, literally sometimes when I was being really bad and I had to confess, I would try to change my voice. And, and think about how sinful that is. I'm being deceitful in the confessional, trying to change my voice. And, and I, would, I would make it higher to sound like a girl. But in grade school, I already sounded like a girl. So I'd have to make it like lower, like my last confession. And I'm sure the priest is like, my God, Monty, I know it's you. You are, what, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, dude, you're about to find out, okay, how much time you got. So we, I would start confessing, and we would get done, and we would get a penance. 
And penance uh, meant this is what you need to do to be absolved of your sins. So he would, and I remember specifically multiple times, but once I remember, I was given uh, 10 Hail Marys, that's a prayer, and then 10 Our Fathers, which is the Lord's Prayer, we just prayed, and, uh, and then maybe the Apostles' Creed or something like that. And he said, go pray these out there and whatever. So I'm, I go out to the pew and I sit down and I kneel down and I start praying. And my buddy, who... who Okay, he comes out of the confessional way too quick, so I already know that he wasn't honest. So he comes out, and I'm like, dude, what'd you get? And he's like, I got five Hail Marys and five Our Fathers. And I'm like, five? five? I got ten, you got five? He's like the crime boss of the third grade. He gets five. I, I just thought, this is such crap. I, I was all mad about that, too. So then I had to confess that. Anyway, it was a bad deal. But confession, I got, I got used to it because we, that's how I was brought up, is to confess to somebody else. But many people aren't used to it. And here's what I can tell you. Every time they lined, up, lined us up for confession, all the students went in, and, and all of them confessed something. So, so what, what that tells me is we all got stuff. We've all got stuff. We, we, we all are not okay. Can we say it that way? Like, admit it. Turn, turn to your neighbor and just say, I'm not okay. I mean, you're not surprising your neighbor, especially if it's your spouse. They know you're far from okay. But we're not Okay. We're not. And I don't know this morning whether you're watching online or you're in the room today what you're dealing with. Some things might seem small. For others, it's things that are big. You, maybe you have a kid that's making some very poor choices and you're, you're freaked out. You know, may, maybe you have a marriage and it, and it hinges on the brink of ending and you don't know what to do. Maybe you're single. Maybe you're single and you're, you're, you're so scared that you're going to spend the rest of your life without finding that, that, that person. Or maybe you're just barely trying to hold it all together right now as you sit here on Mother's Day, cleaned up on the outside, but hurting on the inside. And I'm telling you, regardless of where you're at or, or, or what you got going on in your life, whether you're watching or, or here today, um, you've stepped into an environment, you've stepped into an arena on purpose. Like, this is a church where it's okay to not be okay. This is a church where it's okay to not be okay, but guess what? You don't have to stay that way. And that's what this series, The Best Is Yet To Come, if is all about. And the story, like this story, if you grew up in church circles, you may be familiar with the story that I'm going to preach to you today, but even if you're familiar with it, I guarantee God's going to come at you at an angle where it, it, I hope it hits you like it hit me. The story is found in the gospel of Luke. The gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four books start the New Testament. And the word gospel literally means good news. That's all it means. So it's really good news. So there was a story where Jesus was, was preaching and he and he's illustrates something by telling this story. And it's in Luke 15, verse 11. And you might know it as the story of the prodigal son. Um, and people think prodigal means loss, but prodigal actually means wasteful, is what it means. So the story of the wasteful son, or as I like to call it, the story of the, the loving father, because it goes both ways here. Chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus is speaking. He says, you know what, let me illustrate the point further. Jesus tells a story. He said, a man had two sons. The younger son told the dad, I want my share of the estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide the wealth between the sons. Now that was a crazy statement because normally the son, especially the younger son, who's not even going to get the majority of the, of the inheritance, doesn't come at you like that and say, I'm demanding this for my dad. You don't do that. So the fact that he's doing that is really a sign of disrespect and a sign that says, you know what, dad? I really want nothing to do with you. Verse 13. A few days later, the younger son packed his belongings, right? He has his cash. He has his inheritance. He moves to a distant land. And there, and here is where the prodigal happens, there he wastes all the money on wild living. I, I, as I read that, I wrote this down. Bad things happen. Bad things can happen when you leave the safety of home. We've got some students graduating, right? we got some seniors graduating uh, high school and going off. I'm telling you, and I, love, I, lo I loved, you know, getting away from the house and going to college, but some bad things can happen when you go far from home. Am I right? I mean, my wife Jody and I just went on a little trip a few weeks ago. And for Mother's Day, we gave my mom an early Mother's Day gift. We let her watch uh, her two grandkids. You know, here you go, Mom. So, so we gave her, you know, Jake and Ava. And that was a party, wasn't it, guys? They're staring at me like, what? Okay, so they, grandma watched them, and we went, took a little five-day trip. And on the trip, we were far from home. Like, and um, I don't know what happens on your vacations. Like, like you can't make this stuff up. We, we stay close to where we're supposed to stay, but one day we venture out. 
and we venture out into the city, and it's, uh, it's very touristy, and, and we're haggling, and we're making deals and stuff like that, and we're down in Mexico, and uh, <laughs> we, we, we're at the end of the night, and we're walking, and we, we, we ate, and we shopped a little bit, and we get to this place where there's an outside like, restaurant with a, with a dance floor, like elevated dance floor, and people are, it's packed, people are dancing, and I'm like, you know what? We're on vacation, honey. Let's go dance. And so we're thinking we're going to go dancing, right? So we, I go up to the gal that's kind of at the, uh, the entrance where you get in, and I said, hey, you know, what do we got to do? She said, well, it's 40 bucks. I said, 40 bucks? I said, we're just, just, they're right there. I mean, we might be here five, 10 minutes. So I, I, I know everything's negotiable. So I'm like, all right, let me handle this. So I go up there, and I'm speaking my best uh, Spanish, which is por favor, well, that's it. So I'm like, por favor, you know, we just, five, ten minutes, really quick. We don't, you know, it could be quick. We just want to do, you know, a little dancing, a little shaky, shaky. And uh, I don't think shaky, shaky is Spanish, but that's the best I have. So, so, but as soon as I was talking, she's like, a light bulb went off. She goes, okay. And I'm like, all right, she, she got it. I'm, I'm getting somewhere. She goes, follow me. So she takes me and my wife across the street. And I'm like, Maybe there's a better place, right? This is awesome. So she takes us across the street. This is, you can't make this up. You ask my wife. We takes us into a building, and we go up these stairs. And I'm like, this is kind of weird. I don't, know what I, I don't know what I said. but So I'm up there, and we get to the entrance, and the gal is, um, you'd pay to get into this place, I guess. Well, she strips, the, she takes these uh, uh, wristbands and gives them to us for free. And I'm like, this is awesome. I, she understood. Yes, if it's free, it's for me. That's right. So she gives us the wristbands. We get into this place, and it's like a, a dance place. We go in there, but there's nobody there. We walk in, and like, it's just, there's just the employees. And I'm like, this is weird. But, but there's, they had the elevated dance floor. This one was different than the one outside. This one had, like, two fireman poles. I don't know what that's all about, but had those. And I'm like, yeah, you're catching on. So I'm like, nobody. And we're sitting there, we're like, what is happening? And this this waitress comes up behind us. I kid you not. And here's what she says. Um, do you want to go in the back room with me? And I'm like, I'm like, what's in the back room? You know, I, I'm like, what in the heck? And Jody's like, no, we don't want to go in the back room. I'm like, yeah, we don't want to go in the back room. You know, whatever's back there is not going to bring us closer to Jesus. I know that. So we didn't go in the back room. We, we hit the back door and ran. So I don't know why I told you that. Just to confess, I guess, that I don't this is my life. This is our life. So it was in- unbelievable. So bad things happen when you get far from home. So <laughs> the prodigal's far from home. Oh, gosh. About the time the money ran out, so he partied, the money's gone. A famine sweeps over the land, right? A hard time. He, he begins to starve. He persuades a farmer to hire him, and the man sent him in the field to feed the pigs. Really a a disgusting job for a Jewish boy, especially because pigs are very unclean. You wouldn't be around a pig, let alone with them, uh, feeding them. So, but the young man did it. He's desperate. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. That statement hit me. I've heard this preached a lot of times by a lot of pastors, including myself. What, what a lot of people will say is, oh my gosh, he had it so bad that he was eating pig food in the pig pen. Well, he, no, he wasn't. He, he didn't even get to eat the pig food. I mean, that, the pigs are eating the pig food. They have it better than he does. It says no one gave him anything. It's almost like the farmer was there watching him, you know? He, he give him, he, feed the pigs, go do your job. Don't, hey, don't eat none of that for yourself. That's for the pigs. Think of the degrading, think, I mean, that is a picture of what sin will do in your life. This is such a desolate, desperate moment. He, did, he gets nothing to eat. And then, and then verse 17, this is, where, this is where it starts to turn around. When he finally came to his senses. In other words, when he finally came to the end of himself. When you come to the end of your, yourself, you, you'll get to the beginning of God and what he has for you. He gets to the end of himself. He comes to his senses, it says, and he says to himself, God, at home, I thought even the hired servants, the slaves, they have food to spare. And here I'm dying of hunger. I'm dying of hunger. Like he recognizes the depravity of the situation. See, before we can be healed, we got to see that we're broken. Before we can get help, we got to see that we're, we're in need. <laughs> okay, one more Mexico story and that's it. We, we're coming back and we're in the airport, right? We're, it's over, we're done. And uh, 
we have a few hours before the plane leaves, and a guy, a guy comes up and grabs me, and he pulls me to the side, me and my wife, and he's like, hey, he goes, he goes I can help you with your face. And I'm like, what's wrong with my, what are you talking about? I'm like, what's wrong with my face? And he goes, look, and he puts a mirror in front of my face, and he goes, look at those, look at the dark circles around your eyes. And I thought to myself, dude, if you hung out at Club Shaky Shaky, you'd have some dark circles too, you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, so, so he, uh, he says, I got something. And he pulls out this magical, you know, potion and he starts putting this stuff under my eyes and I'm like this is strange but yeah let's go so he's putting this under my eyes and I'm like okay I'll let him have his fun and then we'll just whatever so so he puts he has me holding a fan on my head so I'm like just more of our vacation right here so I'm holding a fan on my head and under my eye he put this stuff and then he shows me uh in the mirror you guys I'm not kidding you ask my wife it was night and day like I, I thought it was just gonna be oh whatever it was like I look great over here, and now this looked horrible. I'm like, wow, I didn't realize how bad I looked until you did this. It was hideous. I'm like, and this was all smooth and beautiful. And uh, Jody's like, you should get it. You know, she's like, you, honey, you get it. You know, it's, uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, gosh, happy Mother's Day, right? So, I, so I, I, it was very impressive what this stuff did. So I'm like. I'm like, how much is it? He said, he said, $249. I said, $2.49 is awesome. He goes, no, $249. And I said, you're high. I'm not, I did two, no, $249? No way. I got the last laugh. You know why? eBay. It's on the way, baby. It's on the way. So I'll tell you that. So, but, but I didn't realize, it was like Mike Tyson punched me over here. It looked that bad compared to when he finally fixed this side of my head up. So sometimes we don't see how broken we are until we're, and we're the last ones to see it, aren't we? We're the last ones to see the mess. We're the last ones to see the dysfunction. We're the last one to see all the bruises and the bumps. So he sees it. He's to the end of himself. And he says, I'm going to go home to the Father. And I'm going to say this. Dad, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be even called your son. I don't even want that. Just take me in as a hired hand, as a servant. In other words, I'm going to go home and I'm going to confess my mess. I'm going to go to the Father. I'm going to fall at his feet. See, the first step in getting set free is wanting it. The first step in being set free is wanting to be set free. There's a lot of people walking in bondage. They, they, they don't want to get out of it. And it's insane. They wouldn't tell you that because they don't recognize it. But by the way they're living, they're, they're content with it. They're, how do you say it? They're, they're comfortable with it. And, and that's a bad place to be. So, so the son, you guys, he, he, he does what he says. It says in verse 20, so he goes to the dad, and while he was still a long way off, the dad sees him coming, filled with love and compassion. I love that. The dad could have been filled with a lot of other emotions, but he's filled with love and compassion. He runs to the son, he embraces him, he hugs him, he kisses him, and, he's, and his son says, dad, I've sinned, just like he, just like he um, rehearsed. Dad, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house. Put it on him. Get him a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet. I love that statement because the dad doesn't even let the son finish his confession before he calls for a celebration. It's unbelievable. It, oh, that's good. Your confession, it might not seem real fun right away. It never does, confessing. But I'm telling you, it very well may lead to celebration. It did in his case. He celebrates and he continues, the dad keeps talking. I'll kill the fatted calf. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine. He was dead, and now he's returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. And every time I read that scripture, it, it, it hits me. And every time I feel like I have to profess that this is why Meadows will always be this church that will look less like a funeral and more like a party. Because when lost people come home and dead people come back to life, we have something to celebrate. And we do. And we do. God wants to do something in you. The best is yet to come if you and I confess our mess. Proverbs 28, 13. People who conceal their sins won't prosper. It won't happen. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. I love that. Far from home, the prodigal son learned a lot about misery, didn't he? He learned the meaning of it. But when he returned home, when he confessed his mess, 
he discovered the meaning of mercy. It was so different from misery to mercy. To mercy. And, I, and you probably have heard this statement before, but I'll tell it to you again that we're only as sick as our secrets. Right? We're only as sick as our secrets. My secrets, I know, kept me in chains. And do you know why they, they, they keep you in bondage? Here's why and why they make you so sick and unhealthy is because the closer you get to God, the more healthy you are, right? He's the healer. He brings the light. He brings the hope. That it's come, so, but, but, but you know what secrets do? They distance you from God. They distance you from God. And the farther you get from God, the more broken, the more bound, the more, the more chained up, the more restricted that you are. You know this. You ever try to hide something from someone that you care about? It's, it's miserable. I mean miserable. This, I'll go way back to the very, my early 20s. I remember I, I was home watching a movie. This girl was watching a movie with me, and um, I get a phone call, and it's, some, it's another girl. So, okay, I, I got to back up. Kids, there was a time when cell phones didn't exist, okay? Smartphones weren't a thing, and I'll really blow you away. There was a time... When the phone would ring and you didn't know who was calling. Can you imagine that? That's Russian roulette right there, I'll tell you. Might be that. So I was dumb enough to pick up the phone and hear this. And I'm like, oh God. So I have to, so you know what I did? It's embarrassing to tell you this, but so I pretended like I was talking to my mom. My mom. Okay, happy Mother's Day, Mom. You know, so, uh, so, I, so I'm, and she's like, why are you calling me Mom? I'm like, I guess I'm weird. I don't know. So I'm playing this game, and it was a disaster. It didn't end well. You don't need to know how it ended, but not well. So, but, but it keeps you in this. By the way, don't look at me like I'm all jacked up and you're not, okay? You're like, what's wrong with this guy going to Mexico? Hey, listen, you know what I read just this week is that when you're in a fresh relationship with somebody, and you know this, you put on a little facade for a while, don't you? Like, you, you, there's some secrets. There's some things you don't, let out of the, you don't let out of the bucket quite yet, right? You kind of keep them behind this closed, crazy door back here, right? They say people can do it for three to six months. And if, but if you're really good, you can, you can actually hold off for a year. But after a year, it all comes out. All of it does. What's the moral of the story? You need to date somebody for at least a year, kids, before you even commit or get serious. Because after a year, crazy's coming, okay? The manure's going to hit the fan. I'm just saying. So... It's going to happen. So I, uh, looking at me like a mom. Okay, so, but I was in chains. Like, like you, many of you know, I was addicted to drugs. And, but, but as I put this message together, you know, what, you know what hit me? It wasn't the drugs that were keeping me in, in bondage. It was the secrets. I, 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 I kept reflecting on this story, and I'm like, it, it was the fact that it was concealed. Being concealed kept the, kept the, the dysfunction alive. It kept the addiction alive. It, 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 oh, it was not until I went up, I went in the house that day and went up the stairs and talked to Jody and confessed that it snapped the chains, that it broke the bondage, and the healing could start to begin. It wasn't the drugs, it was the secrets. It's so crazy. I love, so he comes to his senses, back to the story. He, it says he changes his mind. That's what he does. He changes his mind. I don't want to be with the pigs anymore. I need to go back to the Father. See, when you change your mind, God will change your heart. And you know how, you know how I can tell you that the prodigal son, that his heart was changed? Look at the story. How did it begin? Remember how it began? Dad, give me. Give me my inheritance. Give me my money. Give me what, come, give me what you owe me. So he starts with, give me, give me, give me. Do you know how he ends? Father, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. He moved from this posture of give to forgive he was changing. His heart was changing. And the father was there to greet him if he returned home. The best is yet to come for the son if he gets out of the pig pen and goes home. Something else I love about the story is the father never really goes, um, you know, desperately searching or looking. I'm sure he wanted to, but maybe he'd already done that 500 times. Who knows? And it didn't work. And this time he stays at home. And he looks every day. He looks a long way off, it says, but unless that son gets up, goes back, and confesses what's been going on, and asks for forgiveness, the worst is yet to come for him. Because, because as far as I know, starvation leads to death. And that's what he was facing. The only reason he could say the best is yet to come is because he returned home and confessed. Here's what I believe. I believe there are people watching online. There are people here today. This is where you find yourself. You're bound up in chains. 
you're struggling. It, it eats, it's eats at you. You feel like you're in the pig pen. You're in the struggle. It's a mess, like you're in the valley. But I came to tell, tell you that your valley can lead to victory if you will confess your mess. It is then that you can say, the best is yet to come. That's when you can say it. So many people can't go there. God, I've been praying for you all week. Because I know that we're, we're, we're coming right out the gate of this series with something very, I mean, this is very private. But sin is very, sin loves to be private. Sin lives in privacy. Sin grows in privacy. Sin grows in the dark. That's why when you bring something into the light, it, it, it will set you free. It's just not easy to do. Most people aren't doing it. Meadows, you're not most people. I'll never stop reminding you of that. Let's, let's reflect on the story one more time. Jesus started the story by saying this. He said, let me illustrate it this way. Huh. What is, what is the purpose of the whole story of the prodigal son? What was Jesus illustrating? It, well, the, the way we know it as going to the word of God. Let's go back right before the story started. It, it started this way. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners, so bad people, you know, people that don't have their stuff together, people that are concealing some stuff, people that aren't okay. You know, people like you and me. People... These, these notorious people, they often came and listened to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law, this made the religious people upset. By the way, we're not into religion. We're into relationship with Christ at the center. So they're upset. Why would you hang out with them? Why would you associate with such sinful people, even, even eating with them? And then what does Jesus do? He tells stories. And all the stories reflect around something that was wayward and then found. And, it, and he closes with the pinnacle story of the prodigal son. And the whole reason the, 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 the son tells the story is because people were mad at him for who he was hanging out with. I, I find it so interesting. We, 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 the world is so divided. You know this. I mean, I, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. More divided than maybe you and I can ever remember. It, whether it's social media, whether it's politics. I mean, you don't have to look very far to say, I don't agree with what they're saying. And, I, you know, you're pro this and I'm pro that. And they're this and I'm that. And I'm voting for them and I can't believe you're voting for them. It's all over the place. We've talked about this. It's insane. And why well, don't agree with them? Okay. Did Jesus agree with the people he hung out with? No. It, think about this for a second. The, the notorious sinners often are going to be with Jesus. They're, they're still sinning. It's not like they're all like, oh my gosh, I used to sin, but now... No, they're, they probably just got done smoking something, snorting something, doing something, hanging out at Shaky Shaky. I don't know, but they're doing something. And then they show up and they meet Jesus. It never says that they, they stopped doing it first, but, they're, but, but Jesus associates with them. Why? I wrote it down. You, Jesus, Jesus wanted to influence them, correct? Did Jesus want to influence them? Yeah, he, if he has influence, he can help change them. You will never influence people that you refuse to associate with. I just, just think about this. I know, I'm, I know we're going off sideways a little bit from the confession piece, but I promise you, we're going to bring it back. You can't influence people that you refuse to associate with. I, you see this all the time. And I, again, I don't, want to, I don't want to hang out with them. I don't want to be associated with them. I'm not saying you should be doing what they're doing or saying what they're saying, or going where they're going, but if you cut yourself off altogether, I see people alienate themselves with half the, half the world because they're going to side over here. I'm like, you'll never influence half the world. I'm not saying you shouldn't have convictions or you shouldn't have beliefs. You should. But the moment you refuse to even be with somebody else or, or, or talk to somebody else or care about somebody else, I'm telling you, we're not going to change people by judging them. We're going to change people by loving them. That's what God says. That's how Jesus changed them. That's what he did. Do you think the men and women, those notorious, horrible people that couldn't get enough of Jesus, do you think they had some secrets? Do you think they had some sin? Do you think they had some unconfessed things going on in their life that they didn't want Jesus to know nothing about, let alone anybody else? Here's what I think about, you, about us sometimes. I think sometimes we, we are so ashamed of the things that we've done and, and, the, and the places we've been and, and the people that we've hurt. And, and we think that Jesus is too, but he's not. See, Jesus, Jesus knew the mistakes that you would make. Jesus knew you would make those decisions. Jesus knew that you would mess up. 
He knew that you would go away. He knew you, you would, he would say this, but you would do that because you wanted what you wanted. You said, gimme, gimme, gimme. He knew that, and he chose the cross anyway. He knew you would be so messed up. But even before he created you, oh, but that, that blows me away. Even before he created us, he knew the things that we would do. All those things. But yet you chose Jesus to create us anyway. I want to be like that son. See, I don't want you to run from God. I want you to run to him. I don't want you to run from the Father. I want you to run to the Father. This, the love of the Father, blows me away. David, arguably one of the greatest kings of Israel, Old Testament now, pre-Jesus coming to earth. He hadn't come to earth yet. David was a, a great king. God even said, he, David, you're, you're a man after my own heart, which is crazy because David was also a horrible sinner. Can you relate? Doing great things for God, saying great things for God, worshiping God, go, go God, and then, you know, Monday rolls around and, you know, it's just, you wouldn't know you knew God at all. I've been there. God, some days I'm still there. David, this psalm in 32, I'm going to read you a couple verses or a few verses. This sums up the entire message. When I refuse to confess my sin, See, if you want to live your best life, you got to confess your mess. If you want to declare the best is yet to come for you and your family, your kids, your circle of influence, you got to confess your mess. When I refused to confess my sin, David said, my body was wasting away. I groaned all day long. Of course you did, David. You were living in bondage. You were tied up, restricted. Day and night, I felt the hand of discipline. It was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer. He, God, you can just picture David's struggle in this unconfession. Finally, he said, what'd you do, David? Because you say, finally, I confessed. I gave it up. All my sins, don't miss the word all. The one sin that you refuse to confess will be the one sin that will hold you back from everything God has for you. I confessed all of my sin, everything. I confessed it all to you. I stopped trying to hide it. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And what did he do, David? What did the Lord do for you? He forgave me. And you forgave me, God. All my guilt is gone. Now let me ask you a question. If God can forgive a guy like David, an adulterer, a murderer, like, don't you think that his grace is big enough for you? Like, his grace is enough. His grace is bigger. It's bigger than your biggest problem, bigger than your biggest challenge, bigger than your biggest mistake, your biggest secret, your biggest sin, your biggest struggle. Your God is bigger. Now to him who's able to do immensely more than he can ask or imagine. He's bigger. David had the guts to pour out. So, why, how is it all possible that we can even come to the place of confession? It's because of Jesus, the teller of the story in our, in our story today. Because of the cross and the resurrection. We talk a lot at Meadows about the love of the Father because it's absolutely incredible. But something you need to know, I've said this before, but it's been a while. God's love is amazing. You would say that, you wouldn't argue with that. Most of you probably wouldn't. God's love doesn't save you. It doesn't. And the reason you know that is because God loves everybody. But we know everybody's not saved. So God's love is incredible, but but it's God's grace. And what's grace? Grace is like, it's getting what you don't even deserve, right? It's, it's living like the prodigal son, doing what you want, living that selfish life, living for you, living for your desires and your wants and your needs, living for the, right? And God says, I love you so much. I'm going to cover you with grace. 
So this is, this is what saves us. God's love don't save you. It's amazing. It just doesn't save you. God's grace saves you. So Jesus Christ dies on a cross. Three days later, this is the key, he rises from the dead. The resurrection, this miracle upon miracles, this is God's grace poured out on you. But that grace, I'm going to be honest, it's worthless unless it combines, like a chemical reaction, unless it combines with your faith. It's worthless for you. It's there. It's God's grace. Like God's love, God's grace abounds for all. It's for everybody. For God so loved the world. That's, that covers everybody. So, so it's our faith that we would believe it, that, that the storyteller Jesus really existed to tell that story of the prodigal son. That we would believe that Jesus lived a perfect life, died on a cross, and then rose from the dead. That we would believe. See, you're saved by God's grace through your faith. That's why, that's why salvation is individual. It's specific. That's why we celebrate individual baptisms. We don't, we don't just baptize 45 people all together and just say, hey, everybody's back. No, it's everybody one at a time because this was their decision. They decided to, to cash in on what Christ did for them. Why wouldn't you? The pro and, and, and the reason it ties to salvation, I'll show you in a second with confession, but I need you to know, I need you to know it's, it's God's grace and your faith that saves you. Your faith and God's grace saves you, not your goodness. You can't be good enough. We say it all the time. I wrote it down again. You, we are not good. It's not being good that saves you. It's God's grace that saves you. Jesus Christ didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus came to bring dead people back to life. If you believe it, can you shout louder? I mean, I know it's early. I know it's only 9 o'clock. But do you love him? Do you want him? I do. The gospel of Jesus Christ. You want that online? Type, I choose Jesus in the comments. We'll connect with you. You want that grace in the room? Want to live a new life? Want, want to start getting on track with Christ and what he has for you? You want the message yet to come? Indicate it on your card so, on your connect card so we can celebrate with you. I close with a scripture that ties it all together. Do we, I have 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins to him, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. I'll read it again, the beginning. If we confess our sins, there's a condition. And here's the main point. We talk about waiting until the very end. The only sin the cross won't cover is the one you won't confess. That's the only one. I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to worship in song. I'm going to have Ava, would you grab those buckets right below you? And you, you see you got note cards on your chairs. Online, if you're watching, online, if you're watching, you can just either make your own note card at home, or if you want to plug it into the comments, you can. We do this from time to time because faith without works is dead. I have no desire to show up for an hour, hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday and I don't want church to be like this little tiny window on a Sunday morning. I want to be the church. And I believe you do too. Well, we can't give out what we don't have. And unconfessed sin is holding you back and you know who you are. So here's what we're going to do. During the final song, you can write down any unconfessed sin on the piece of paper. You don't need to put your name on it. You can if you want, but you don't need to. Fold it up, whatever. And, and, and you're, during the song, just come up here as an offering to God that you're going you're gonna to put it in, you're going to give it to God. That's you confessing to God right here. That's what we're doing. Okay, it, it can't end there. That, that's the confession to God that gives you forgiveness. But, but the Bible says we confess to others for healing. Some of you may not be ready today, but the prayer team, the prayer room's right over there. The prayer team at the end of the worship song is gonna come up here and, and it can be them, it can be somebody in your role, it could be your spouse, it could be the, pr uh, the prayer room. I don't care who it is. But some of you, you're gonna confess it to somebody else. 
Some of you may, maybe aren't ready for that right this second. I'm going to be praying for you that you will be soon. Because that sin will hold you, I promise, that secret will hold you back. God knows it anyway. But when you tell somebody else, it unleashes the power of the enemy. Like he can't hold on anymore. I want that for you. I know the devil's going to tell you, don't do it. They're going to judge you. No, they're not. No, they're not. Trust me. The things I've done, and I'm the pastor of this church, no one's judging you for anything. Shaky, shaky, remember? So, sorry. So, my prayer is that you'll do whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do. This, is, this message is, uh, I, w- I wouldn't call it easy. I think it's easy to hear a message and then leave and celebrate Mother's Day and hang out together. And that's great. And I want you to do that. But, but don't leave any unfinished business before the Father. Some of you need to sign up for baptism. And you know who you are. And I pray that you'll do that so we can celebrate new life. Others will surrender your life to Christ. Others, the Holy Spirit is going to tell you something completely different. Because he's speaking to you right now on purpose, individually. So, your next step, I'm going to pray. We'll sing together. You'll write down whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to write down. Give that, give that, let God keep it, forgive it. And then, I hope many of you will confess to somebody today, whether it's the prayer team or somebody else that you choose, it doesn't matter. But confessing to somebody else is absolutely critical for you to live your best life. And that's what Jesus died for, that you would live your best life. He loves you so much. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, we thank you for this crazy story of a wayward, selfish life. Gosh, God, none of us can relate to that. I mean, when do we ever just go off and do our own thing and live for our own desires? I mean, it's our, it's our story, God, and you know it. That's why you would illustrate it in this way. God, help us get real. We don't want to play church. We, we want to come here and we want life transformation. There's people desperate and dying on the inside. This is a key to freedom. I pray that we will all take advantage of it, Father. I thank you for the gospel that went forth. The gospel, God, you said it. Your grace plus our faith equals eternal life in you, now and forever. We want that, God. I pray many will surrender to you today, online, in the room, others signing up for baptism, many confessing sin, certainly to you, Father, but then to other people. And I know there's going to be tears. I know there's going to be um, Strife. I know there's going to be tension, but I, I, I think you're okay with that. There was a lot of tension around you, Jesus. All your whole life was filled with tension, and, and no one changed the world more than you ever will. So I, I pray we embrace that tension and that, and that, I don't know, that conflict, I guess you could say, within us. And God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you're going to give us the strength to overcome by your strength and do what you're calling us to do, God. See, we're going to keep declaring it in this series, God. The best is yet to come. If today we confess our mess, God, give us the courage to do it. In Jesus' name I pray and we all say, amen.